Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 43 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. How and when did doctors become respected professionals in American society? Today, we explore early American medical history and reform movements. Reform movements fascinate me. And they fascinate me because there's just so many of them after the War of 1812. And of course, there's reasons for this. First, you have the end of the War of 1812. The end of that war brought many Americans a sense of security that the United States and its people would continue to remain independent from Great Britain. Second, you have the Second Great Awakening. You may recall guest historians Kyle Boltice and Shelby Balick in episodes 20 and 30 discussing this movement. The Second Great Awakening was a Protestant revival movement that peaked somewhere between 1800 and 1840 and sought to prepare the nation for Christ's return. Third, by the late 1810s and 1820s, American society and its economy had changed and was continuing to change as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So reform movements proliferate because whether they are secular or religious, they seek to improve American society and explain the great social and economic changes that had taken place and were taking place within it. Over the next three weeks, we're going to explore religious and reform movements that took place during the early to mid 19th century. And today's guest historian, Matthew Osborne, helps us kick off our exploration by taking us through American perceptions of alcoholic insanity during the 19th century. During our conversation, Matthew reveals what delirium tremens are, why early Americans became fascinated with delirium tremens, and the excessive drinking of alcohol during the 1820s, and information about the temperance movement and how doctors used the movement to elevate their social and professional status in American society. We don't cover a lot of medical history on this show, but it is a fascinating topic, and I know you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So let's go meet Matthew Osborne. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Matthew Osborne is an assistant professor of history at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. His research interests include medicine and disease, addiction, literary culture, and urban history. Matthew is the author of Rum Maniacs, Alcoholic Insanity in the Early American Republic, which reveals how delirium tremens have shaped our modern conceptions of alcoholism. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Matthew. Thanks so much, Liz. I love your show. It's really an honor to be on. Wow. We have fans that are also historians. This is great. We're excited to have you on today so we can explore alcoholic insanity in the early American Republic, as well as the professionalization of medical doctors in United States history. One aspect of your book that really surprised me was how doctors were perceived by early Americans. I mean, when we think of doctors today, we tend to think of professionals, people who will make us feel better or mend our ill health. But this seems to be a modern day positive perception that early Americans did not share. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the medical profession in early America, first of all, there were very few university trained doctors, which was unlike Europe, where there was very well established medical professions. So Americans relied on themselves for medical care and for people that were respected in the community, midwives, healers. So it wasn't until the late 19th century that the medical profession as we think of it today really began to take shape in, you know, around the American Medical Association and organizations like that. Would you tell us a bit about yourself and what drew you to study delirium tremens and its influence on modern day alcoholism? And I guess really to get at this, we should really start by defining what delirium tremens is or are. Right. The way we describe delirium tremens today is a acute insanity that can develop in cases of alcohol withdrawal. 
and that insanity is especially marked by vivid hallucinations and trembling. So the, the word refers to the uncontrollable trembling that's experienced. Delirium tremens, the disease, is first described in medical journals in 1813, and their definition was a little broader. And it was, they didn't link it especially with withdrawal because um, ideas about addiction were, were just taking shape. And they especially cited the most important symptom was the trembling and the hallucinations and feelings of paranoia. So it was essentially alcohol-induced insanity. So delirium tremens can develop in cases of acute alcohol withdrawal, but it doesn't always develop. So it especially strikes people who have been drinking over a long period of time. The reason I kind of came across this because, you know, as a graduate student, I was desperately looking for a topic (laughs) to research. But I had always, since I was an undergrad, I had always been fascinated by the idea that drinking had a history. I had read Bill Rohrabaugh's fascinating book, Alcoholic Republic, which was really kind of founded the field of alcohol studies in early America. And then when I was hanging around UC Berkeley after I had graduated, I was introduced to early American history by David Henkin, and uh, he put uh, Karen Halton's book on the history of murder into my hands. And I went, you know, I just became fascinated by the study of middle-class culture in early America. I went to study with Karen Halton, and I found these fascinating medical journal articles, and it just kind of it was a research topic that just totally unfolded in front of me. In some ways, I feel like it the research topic found me more than I found it, actually. Rum Maniacs traces how and why heavy drinking became a subject of medical interest, social controversy, and lurid fascination in the early republic. Matthew, what caused early Americans to become fascinated by the heavy consumption of alcohol, and when did this interest emerge? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that people drank a lot in the 18th century, in the early 18th century and in the late 18th century. (laughs) Um, And you know, by our modern standards, it's kind of eye-popping how much they drank. They drank throughout the day, at work, after work, at breakfast. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that water was unreliable, and it was thought to be healthful and invigorating. And, you know, they didn't have, like today, we regulate ourselves with all sorts of drugs, you know, aspirins and antidepressants and um, energy drinks. For them, alcohol was the way that they regulated themselves. But it's after the revolution, the American Revolution, that heavy drinking really begins to take on this really significant symbolic dimension that has to do with the responsibilities of individuals in a Republican society. And so what you see is a whole outpouring of writing by religious figures, by medical professionals, by, you know, kind of leading citizens about the dangers of alcohol abuse. And those concerns were especially focused on kind of ordinary people. And it was linked with the threat of social disorder. And the, it was a lot of anxieties about here in a society in which we're, we're going to secure our liberty based on the virtues of the electorate. We need to have a virtuous electorate. And that increasingly meant a sober electorate. It also seemed like the increase in early American fascination with heavy drinking was pushed by doctors. Doctors just really became fascinated with heavy drinking. Would you tell us why doctors became fascinated with heavy drinking and why they chose to study delirium tremens? Yeah, the individual who's really responsible for this is Benjamin Rush, who was the most prominent physician in the early republic, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he taught for decades at the University of Pennsylvania, which was the largest medical school at the time. And he took on writing as, or he took on temperance as uh, kind of a, you know, like a, a lifelong cause that he really promoted. He's most known for his temperance writing. He wrote for, you know, a popular audience. But in his medical lectures, he really imbued his medical students with a huge concern for the effects of alcohol on the body. And this is really distinctive of the American medical profession. They were, he was taking European ideas, but when he applied them in the American context, he really amplified concerns about the effects of alcohol on the body. 
that effect, he had thousands of students, all the you know medical professors at the University of Pennsylvania studied with him. So in the late 1810s and 1820s, doctors continued to be fascinated by the effects of alcohol on the body. Delirium tremens was a diagnosis created in Europe, but when it took off here in the United States because there was this fascination with alcohol abuse, that's particularly one of the reasons. And for, for doctors, you can see that it had a lot of appeal because Americans broadly saw alcohol abuse as a huge social problem and a a threat to the republic. So doctors, by responding to the problem of alcohol abuse, were uh, asserting themselves not not just as medical professionals, but also as doing something for the good of society uh, and republican society. So it it had the effect of uh, making the profession uh, look good. What sorts of problems did early Americans see with heavy drinking? I mean, Heavy drinking is really a part of their culture, but you mentioned that doctors want to fix society because society perceives it as a problem. One of the things that always fascinates me about alcohol studies is that the problems people associate with drinking or drug abuse often have little to do with actual alcohol and drug consumption, right? So in the early republic, people in the 1790s were associating these concerns about drinking with social disorder. In the 1810s, there's a huge concern that drinking is causing an increase in poverty. And in the 1820s, there's this huge concern that drinking is causing young men who are involved in business, it's leading them into bankruptcy and penury. So even though I don't think that alcohol consumption is changing very much during these decades, it becomes increasingly controversial, and yet within each decade, there's new concerns that are kind of being heaped on top of it. That It's like heavy drinking, because it's ubiquitous, it's controversial, it causes all sorts of problems, it becomes very highly symbolic. And it's an easy thing for people to point to when they're concerned about larger social issues. Let's explore one of these larger social issues, like the economy. By the 1810s, doctors seem to have equated delirium tremens with the struggle for success in the early American economy. And you touched upon that in your in your previous answer. What was the early American economy like during the 1810s and 1820s? And did the quest for success in this economy really drive people to drink heavily? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, one of the like overarching narratives of American history is that the War of 1812 was kind of the second war of independence. And that after the War of 1812, the idea of the Republic is kind of settled. This anxiety that the Republic is going to dissolve or that it's fragile has gone away. It feels much more solid. So in the late 1810s, Benjamin Rush's kind of Republican concerns that drunkenness is going to undermine the virtue of the Republic, that kind of goes away by the late 1810s. And the discussion about drinking and alcohol abuse and delirium tremens is much more about economic issues. And it's at the same moment that the economy is really changing. After the War of 1812, historians have generally talked about how the first Industrial Revolution really begins to take off. And with that is a new kind of market economy that's very unstable. There's new systems of exchange. There's banks are proliferating across the country. There's, you know, all this fascinating scholarship recently on the explosion of currency during this era. So it was very susceptible to boom and bust. It subjected people to new forms of wage labor that they had never been subjected to before. And this creates a really large growth in poverty, first of all. And people are, you know, leading citizens are wondering, how is it that we have poor people on our streets who are are freezing to death? The answer that comes back is overwhelmingly, well, they must be drinking too much. We live in the land of opportunity. These people, if they simply worked hard, wouldn't, you know, and didn't drink so much, I'm sure could find, at least find enough money to pay for, you know, wood for their fires. But after the panic of 1819, especially, that was a financial panic that really devastated the economy. So the estimate in Philadelphia is that 80% of people were unemployed in the wake of the panic of 1819. And it's in that context that people began to associate alcoholic insanity, especially with bankruptcy. So people who are educated, hardworking, merchant types or business types, 
falling into poverty and despair, that delirium tremens became symbolic of that. It became a, the disease became a way in which doctors began to tell these stories about um, people falling into penury. You mentioned how wealthy people questioned how we could have poor people that are freezing and that they equated that their struggles with the fact that they were likely heavy drinkers. It seemed that there were a lot of people who believed that heavy drinking was a poor person problem. Did their perceptions have any merit or truth to them? Were poor people more susceptible to heavy drinking than middle class or wealthy people? Yeah, that's, I mean, I had that question a lot. And it's impossible to know. You know, today, for instance, people with a college education are much more likely to be alcoholics than people who do not complete high school. Who is drinking in the early republic and how much is really unclear. Poor people, the reason that their drinking is more visible is because they're drinking on the streets, right? The same way it is today. Wealthy people are drinking indoors. If a poor person becomes overwhelmed by intoxication, then they have to go to the almshouse and they get recorded, arrested and recorded. Wealthy people, if they succumb to delirium tremens, they call a private doctor and it all happens indoors and it's not recorded. So the medical statistics and statistics that still survive from that era don't really help us to understand that question. But what is true is that leading Americans saw the problem of alcohol abuse as a problem of poor people. It was a way of assigning personal responsibility for the condition of poverty. Uh, And in a way, it was rationalizing the shortcomings of the new economy that's emerging. So the same people who are responsible for organizing factories and subjecting people to wage labor are also the people who are writing these, you know, who are responsible for poor relief and who are writing these tracts denouncing the poor as being intemperate. It really is an issue of perception. You use alcohol as a way to explain other societal problems because you can't explain them. And then the people who are also explaining these problems are the ones that are dealing with people who may or may not be suffering from them. Right. So, for instance, Matthias Baldwin was the founder of the um, Baldwin Locomotive Works, and there's a statue of him outside of uh, Philadelphia City Hall today. He's like the ultimate self-made man in Philadelphia history, you know, one of these early capitalists. He's also one of the most outspoken promoters of temperance, the need for temperance and the importance of temperance and the, the significance of drinking to creating the cause of poverty. So the same people who are creating this market economy are also trying to, are also using alcohol as a way of beating up on the people who are most affected by the consequences of industrial transformation. You mentioned that the statistics from the period are unreliable. In Rum Maniacs, Matthew uses many examples of men who suffered from heavy drinking and delirium tremens. But Matthew, I wonder whether or not you saw any evidence of of whether African Americans or women also suffered from delirium tremens. Were they likely to suffer from them more or less than white men? Or is there just no way to measure it? Yeah, this was some of the most difficult and rewarding research that I did. You know, a lot of that, a lot of those statistics are in chapter three. And I think in chapter three, you can see I struggle with it a little bit. When you look at the burial statistics or you look at hospital records, what you're looking at is somebody is a doctor is looking at a person and they're writing down a disease, right? So somebody dies, somebody has to fill in the box that says cause of death, right? What I found was people who died of delirium tremens or people who died of intemperance, quote unquote, which just meant heavy drinking, actually had very complicated medical histories and they had and they died in circumstances that were very ambiguous. So what those statistics tell us is that white men were more likely to be classified as having died of delirium tremens, right? So delirium tremens victims in the 1820s were overwhelmingly white men, 85%. But women who, people who died of intemperance, 50% of them were women. So that means that if a woman dies she is just as likely as a man to be labeled as having died of intemperance. But when you look under the surface there, they die in very similar circumstances. African-Americans 
very rarely have a cause of death assigned to them because people just didn't care. I mean, that's the horrible truth of it. A black person dies in a vacant lot. The uh, coroner doesn't even investigate, and, you know, they're buried and forgotten. But if a white man dies of delirium tremens, that is, uh, that's a death that has a very kind of troubling social consequence, right? If he's a middle-class person, you don't want to write that he, wrote, he died of intemperance because he's a respectable person. So delirium tremens became a way in which doctors could assign a cause of death that wasn't stigmatizing. We may not know whether heavy drinking was an actual problem, but it was a perceived problem. Let's talk about the temperance movement. Would you tell us about the movement and how men and women went about encouraging their fellow countrymen not to drink or to drink less? Yeah, the temperance movement, it kind of begins with Benjamin Rush's, you know, writings in beginning in 1783, right after the revolution, he's writing about the importance of temperance. It gets picked up by evangelicals, evangelical ministers in New England. There are local temperance societies that kind of bubble along in the 1820s. The national temperance movement really takes off in the late 1820s with the call by Lyman Beecher, who's the most prominent evangelical minister of the day, and and like a conservative national figure, he publishes a book called Six Sermons on Intemperance. And this is kind of taken as a clarion call by social activists who begin founding local temperance societies. So the temperance movement was always a kind of a union or an alliance, I should say, of uh, doctors, evangelical ministers, and, and and Christian believers, and industrialists like Matthias Baldwin. Doctors provided a lot of the ideas that equated temperance and health and heavy drinking and disease. Um, Even evangelical ministers, the, the most common argument they made is that you have to stop drinking because it's really bad for your body. So like Lyman Beecher in his six, temperance, six sermons on intemperance, he spends a lot of time talking about how horrible liquor is to your stomach, uh, which, which came right out of the medical literature of the time. So in the 1820s, those temperance societies were very interested in keeping temperate people temperate. It was not people going out and trying to lift drunkards out of the gutter and get them um, you know, health and medical care. They wanted to impress respectable young men with the importance of remaining temperate and, that, and the idea was that if you didn't drink, if you went to church, if you had a healthy diet and you worked hard, that that would inevitably lead you to social success. And doctors were, Philadelphia was the a national hub for temperance activity. All the prominent doctors in the temperance movement were all educated at the University of Pennsylvania. And they, the doc, doctors were always uh, crucial to that. And, and that legacy still survives today. You know, think about the importance of physicians in the anti-smoking movements. And, you know, you think about the smoker's lung that we were all terrified by when we were in grade school. Um, doctors played a very similar role in popularizing images of diseased organs, organs diseased by alcohol. We know that in the early 20th century, the temperance movement will get a constitutional amendment to ban alcoholic beverages in the United States. Is that the same temperance movement that's functioning in the 19th century? And regardless, does the temperance movement in the 19th century have any success in curbing drinking? It is, you know, the, I think you can draw a line in the temperance, you know, from the temperance movement from Benjamin Rush to Prohibition. By prohibition, you're talking about a far different society, of course. So, like a lot of the a lot of the concerns about that drive prohibition have to do with um, immigration and the state of the cities and nativism, and they also have to do with uh, the women's rights movement of that time. So, a lot of the social activists look much different. The concerns look a little different, but the same rhetoric about alcohol and its importance to, to a virtuous electorate and, and uh, sobriety and democracy, those are, those are ideas that Benjamin Rush first articulates and which remain powerful in the early 20th century. Whether or not the 19th century temperance movement helped or, you know, was good for public health, 
Bill Rohrabaugh in the Alcoholic Republic argues that it was very important, and he tracks a drop in usage by the 1840s. There is lots of evidence, like kind of anecdotal evidence in diaries and in published tracts that, um, that respectable middle-class people started drinking a lot less. I didn't, when I was looking just at, you know, a lot of my research was in the study of alcohol abuse, not of drinking, right? So my evidence spoke to how many people are dying of alcohol abuse, how many people are being treated for alcohol abuse, things like that. And that number is only going up. In other words, alcohol abuse does not seem to be affected at all by the temperance movement. Now, of course, I'm looking in Philadelphia, which is a very large, rapidly growing, diverse city. It might be really different in a place like Rochester, which was deeply affected by the Christian evangelicals, very active in the temperance movement in a much smaller city. That city, um, it may be that in Rochester, drinking dropped off, or in other rural areas. So, for instance, in Kansas City, where I am, people love to talk about how prohibition never took hold in Kansas City. I think it's probably true uh, in the mid-19th century also. Some communities were probably more temperate um, than others. In Philadelphia, I didn't see any evidence that the temperance movement was very successful at all. Did the temperance movement have any luck with its secondary mission. One of the surprising details I discovered in Romaniacs is that the temperance movement wasn't just about curbing drinking. Many doctors used the temperance movement as a way to spread a message that you shouldn't practice certain unorthodox systems of medicine. Would you tell us about these unorthodox systems of medicine, Matthew, and whether the temperance movement helped doctors curb them? Yeah, and uh, this is this gets to like the heart of you know the history of medicine in America. Why we have the the medical profession we have today is that in the early 19th century there were no effective licensing laws, so anybody could practice medicine. You just have to put a sign out. So in that context, it really forced doctors to practice in a very different way than they practice today. Today, we go to the hospital and we assume that this person has diplomas, they've, been, they've gone through an intense and rigorous education, they're overseen by, you know, regulations and oversight. We know there are good doctors and bad doctors, but we trust them if they have a license. Back then, you trusted the person who you had confidence in. So, you know, you could, if you were a magnetic healer who hypnotized people, the Thompsonians were a very popular medical movement that was explicitly kind of anti-elitist, right? That it was meant that ordinary people could practice Thompson, Thompsonian medicine, and it was mostly focused on the use of herbs and, and botanical medicines. There were things like the water cure. Phrenology was still very popular in which people, it was the science of reading the structure of the skull in order to gain insight into your kind of mental attributes and capacities. So in that very diverse marketplace, university trained doctors had to go out and make the case for the efficacy of orthodox medicine, you know, and they couldn't just rely on their license and diploma. They had to actually practice. They had to actually demonstrate it. Well, that's hard to do in an era when doctors really didn't have a whole lot to offer, right? You have devastating epidemics, the cholera epidemic, you know, you don't have effect, you know, morphine isn't really in in widespread use until the Civil War. Doctors were still doing things like bleeding people, you know, medical practices that today seem to us seem barbaric, but at the time were, were quite accepted. So one of the ways, one of the strategies that was very important to the American medical profession in the 20s and 30s was getting involved in the temperance movement. And if you think about it, if you're a doctor in a local community, you want to give people confidence that you're a a good, upstanding person. Being a member of the local temperance society and lecturing people on the importance of temperance was one way to give people confidence in you. Now, of course, Practitioners of unorthodox medicine also quickly learned this lesson. So by the 40s, the Thompsonians and the water cure people are, are also advocating temperance as a way of gaining people's confidence as well. So, but that's the effect of, a, you know, of the kind of a free marketplace. 
By the 1850s, delirium tremens had become a topic of popular entertainment. Matthew, how did early Americans create entertainment out of this disease? And what was the nature of delirium tremens as sensationalism? Is this just like a schadenfreude moment or people just, you know, curious about it? Yeah, this was one of the things that really struck me from the beginning. When, when you read these medical journal articles from the 1810s and 20s, and these are case histories that doctors are writing for a medical journal in order, you know, sometimes they're like um, medical students who, who are writing a dissertation and then publishing it, but they're writing it to other professionals. It's not written for public consumption. They write these stories that are like ghost stories, like they tell stories of then he was chased down the street by goblins and he came across an emerald city and and they tell these, like, stories, a lot of the stories are are very gothic. You know, this is the age when gothic novels like The Castle of Otranto are are really the best-selling novels. They're very popular during this era. And in these medical journal articles, they read like ghost stories. So, one of the surprising things I found was that doctors were drawing on tropes from popular culture to make their case histories engaging and entertaining for each other. So, you know, and I even have doctors who say, you know, well, I want to share this case history with you because I'm sure you're going to be entertained by it. And then they tell this wild ghost story about the, you know, a man who's, who's being chased around by alcoholic demons. So in, in some ways, the disease has always been popular entertainment. <laughs> it's always been entertaining. People knew in the 18th century that heavy drinking led to insanity. But in the 18th century, they just gave them liquor and, and didn't think about it. It's in the early 19th century that people begin telling these wild ghost stories and linking those ghost stories with these social issues like bankruptcy and penury. And this isn't too, you know, unique. Like, you know, think about um, the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. There were social commentators who talked about that being the gay plague, right? And in a lot of ways, AIDS and concerns about AIDS were a way in which people were describing uh, anxieties about these newly visible gay communities in San Francisco and New York and other places. Delirium tremens became highly symbolic about individual success in the early republic. So, The way it gets into popular culture is first it's discussed in the medical journals, then doctors involved in the temperance movement take those those wild stories and begin telling them in lectures. And then by the 1840s, what you have is the emergence of first-person accounts of people who say, I suffered delirium tremens and it was horrible and let me tell you my story. The most important figure in that is John Goff, who's, you know, maybe the greatest lecturer of the 19th century And he basically makes his reputation by telling these long emotional stories about his struggles with alcohol and his ability to become sober. And at the height of his performance was always he performed the disease delirium tremens on the stage. And it was, you know, remembered as incredibly affecting. And then it makes its way into popular theater. So the most the two most popular plays of the 19th century, probably, you know, up there with Uncle Tom's Cabin, are The Drunkard and Ten Nights in a Barroom. The Drunkard is first plays in 1847. I'm going to have to check that date. I think it's 1847. And then it's brought by P.T. Barnum to New York, and it plays every night for decades um, in New York. And at the height of that play, the actor, main actor, um, performs Delirium Tremens. And that performance of Delirium Tremens became like, it became like a marker for up-and-coming actors, that you really had to deliver that performance in order to kind of make your reputation. But you're right, like why, I mean, this is an ugly disease. You know, when you talk to nurses and doctors who've actually seen it or people who suffered it, it has, you know, it's awful what people go through, vomiting, you know, there's lots of ugliness to it. Why would people find it so fascinating? Why, how did it become entertaining? And it's, there was something fascinating about watching somebody go through some kind of personal transformation. It's a very kind of romantic idea that still is very prevalent in our society. So the example that I always give is, which is in the epilogue, 
is think about the um, pink elephant scene in Dumbo. Dumbo's gotten accidentally intoxicated, and as a result of that, he starts um, imagining these wild pink elephants. And it becomes, it's quite a frightening nightmare in the beginning, but by the end, it's become kind of quite exciting. And once he comes out of his dream, he's up in a tall tree, and these crows are laughing at him. And it's through that alcoholic nightmare that he discovers his ability to fly. So delirium tremens became a way in which people experienced some kind of personal transformation that didn't happen because you were temperate and hardworking. It happened because you became overwhelmed with these imaginative demons. I was really excited to read your epilogue because Dumbo is my favorite Disney movie and Dumbo is really overlooked by everyone. And then I was excited. I was like, oh my God, he's talking about Dumbo. And then I was like, oh, I now I have to sit back and analyze why do I like Dumbo so much? Right. And it's kind of depressing. When you look, when you, <laughs> when you get at what the message of Dumbo is, it's a little insensitive. I mean, Julian Tremors is an awful, ugly disease. It does not belong in a children's cartoon. And that's kind of what I was playing with in the epilogue is how in the world did this terrible disease, life-threatening disease, get into a children's cartoon? I actually had the experience of lecturing on Dumbo early in my project. And when I got back to my office, a student had followed me to the office and in tears and told me that she had suffered delirium tremens and that it was an absolutely horrible thing, and she couldn't believe that it would be trivialized like that, and kind of she felt like it was uh, that somehow her experience had been mocked by Dumbo. But, you know, it's on, like, there's a very popular Belgian beer now called Delirium Tremens. Um, it really is remarkable, and, but the thing, it's because this disease, which, we, which is really kind of invisible in our society now, it's, it really, is, it ha- it's very common in hospitals, but it's not not recorded in hospitals. This disease has been in popular culture for, you know, 200 years. It's really fascinating. Well, I had no idea the delirium tremens were in Dumbo. I'm sure when I was a little kid and watching that movie, I was very much into the elephants and the fact that, you know, Dumbo made it at the end. But it is a scary moment. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a scary moment. And what's really funny is when you look on YouTube at it, in the comments section, people always say, wow, these guys must have been on LSD. You know, <laughs> that it, it immediately elicits comparisons with psychedelics. And I think, you know, one of the things I try to draw there in the epilogue, and it's very cursory. I mean, maybe someday I'll write another book about the 20th century. But this fascination with hallucinations and personal transformation it, that you see in the 60s in the psychedelic generation can can be traced back to 19th century popular culture around delirium tremens. Did the early American thirst for delirium tremens as entertainment drive anyone to drink to produce this type of entertainment? Like I'm thinking of Edgar Allan Poe, who is a great example of the Gothic. Everything that he wrote was Gothic, but he was also a heavy drinker. I don't think you could say he was driven, but there's tons of you know, alcohol and drug imagery in his stories. He really draws on this dark temperance imagery uh, in really remarkably brilliant ways in stories like The Black Cat. And even, you know, in stories in the book, I, I, I kind of highlight the way that the book, The Maelstrom, which is about the huge whirlpool that these fishermen almost get caught into and one remarkably survives, that was a very po- powerful temperance image that, that he takes and turns into uh, this kind of wild story about men fighting against the forces of nature. Yeah, Edgar Allan Poe was, you know, I think this, you know, I'm not, I wasn't a literary scholar when I began this project, but studying Delirium Tremens really opened up the imagery of Edgar Allan Poe for me. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, he reportedly died of delirium tremens. We know that he experienced delirium tremens. He writes about the experience. And we know that he experimented with opium and you know, drugs like that. So absolutely, I think that he is fascinated in the same way a lot of those romantics were with these extreme states of consciousness and insanity and altered, you know, altered consciousness. I think that it is time for us to come full circle. Now that we have discussed the disease of delirium tremens and how it was perceived in the early republic, I wonder if we can answer the question that rum maniacs set out 
to answer, which is how delirium tremens has shaped our modern conceptions of alcoholism. So, Matthew, would you tell us how these 19th century beliefs and perceptions of delirium tremens have shaped our modern day conceptions of alcoholism? Yeah, I think well, often when you know people write on the history of addiction, the way they tell the story is that addiction was a way in which people began to or ideas about addiction was a way in which people began to medicalize the ideas around self-control. So people who couldn't live up to these ideals of self-control that are required by industrial society, people who drank too much or, you know, addiction, what we, you know, the addiction science of the late 19th century appears at the same time that people are worried about like kleptomania, the disease of stealing things. In the same way, addiction is a disease where you you can't stay sober the way you're supposed to. But the story of delirium tremens is really more complicated than that because it's clearly a disease that's totally fascinating to people. Um, Even respectable middle-class sober people flocked to performances of 10 nights in a bar room to watch somebody go through this wild transformation. So I think, you know, we, in common parlance, we talk about alcohol and drug addicts being pursued by inner demons. You know, they're struggling with their demons. That comes directly from, that idea comes out of the literature of delirium tremens, that within us we have these irrational impulses. We have these alcoholic demons that well up from our unconscious and drive us to do things that are just crazy, you know, that are told, that can consume us and ultimately destroy us. And you see this in lots of imagery in the 20th century. So, for instance, The the Shining is a movie about a guy struggling with his impulses to drink who then becomes a wild mass murderer, right? There's lots of ways in Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson had a delirium tremens experience when he finally reaches the mountaintop um, experience and, and is able to claim sobriety and launch the crusade that is Alcoholics Anonymous. So I think that the literature on delirium tremens has given us a kind of romantic fascination with alcohol abuse and addiction and drug addiction that I think is distinctly American, really, that I think we romanticize these things. We, We know that alcohol abuse and drug abuse are terrible, but we can't resist looking at it. We can't resist reading about it. And I think that that kind of romantic fascination comes directly out of the 19th century. Let's transition to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Matthew, in your opinion, what might have happened if doctors had not taken such an interest in delirium tremens in the early 19th century? Would early Americans have taken a strong interest in the disease and its symptoms at all? And if not, how would our modern day understandings of alcoholism be different? Right. This is a great thing. And It's something I thought about when I was doing the research. Like in cultural history, it's hard to get a sense of contingency, you know, because you're talking about broad cultural transformations. But, you know, delirium tremens was a disease popularized, like these wild case histories were written and popularized by a small group of doctors in Philadelphia, which then became a huge part of American culture. If doctors like Joseph Clapp or Benjamin Coates, very prominent totally unknown (laughs) now, very prominent 19th century physicians, if they hadn't popularized delirium tremens, I think that we wouldn't have had pink elephants. I think that the way in which Americans uh, talk about alcohol abuse and drug abuse is today, it's really quite contradictory and, and a little messed up. We talk about the importance, you know, that we spend millions of dollars fighting drugs and yet drug, you know, American drug consumption drives the worldwide production of drugs. We talk about the importance of temperance, but Americans are notoriously um, heavy drinkers. I think 
without this kind of romanticization of this this kind of romantic fascination with uh, that Delirium Tremens speaks to, I think that our discussions about alcohol could be much more pragmatic, much more much more focused on public health outcomes. You know, there was nothing inevitable about doctors becoming fascinated by delirium tremens. Today, doctors really aren't that interested in delirium tremens. They're fascinated by addiction. That's a product of history. And I think it's one of the legacies of delirium tremens is this, our shows like you know, celebrity, oh, I can't remember. It's the um, the shows in which celebrities are going through addiction rehab, right? Celebrity rehab, I think it's called. I didn't even know there was a show about that. Oh, yeah. I've seen only a couple episodes, but yeah, it's hysterical. But that kind of fascination where we can't resist looking, rather than treating alcohol, at, um, alcohol abuse as a public health issue and a medical problem, I think that's a legacy of, or at least, Delirium tremens, the fascination with delirium tremens was a symptom of this a kind of underlying problem with how Americans try to confront the very real challenges associated with alcohol abuse. The past affects the way we view the present, just as the present affects the way we view the past. That's right. Would you tell us about what aspect of history you were researching and writing about now? Yeah, my current book is on America's first superhero who was the Nighthawk, who appears in the late 1820s, who's a fictional character that appears in the pages of a radical uh, labor journal. So this, you know, nobody's written on him before. He's a character that, you know, the modern comic book superheroes appear in the 1930s. He's not a comic book. It's a, um, it's a column that appears in the newspaper. Um, but he has lots of elements. You know, he flies, things like that. Uh, of 20th century comic book superheroes. So it's a book about him, the character, the author, the literary inspiration, and it's trying to get at the question of, you know, why do Americans want to put on masks and chase bad guys? So is flying his superpower? Yes, flying and stealth, and the ability to kind of see in secret places, to, you know, He's not a man of action the way that Superman is. He often is just an observer, although he, he does rescue women in distress and, and things like that. But yeah, he's, you know, he's not, right, if he and Superman went into an alley, Superman would come out first, okay? He's not going to beat Superman, but I would argue that the power of flight in the 1820s is much more radical than it is in the 1930s. That sounds like such a fun project. I am having a lot of fun with it. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? You can look at the UMKC History Department webpage, University of Missouri, Kansas City, and that has all my contact information. I have an author page on Amazon, but it's, you know, there's not much there. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, people could follow me on Twitter, UMKC History Prof, P-R- UMKC History Prof, P-R-O-F. And I tweet, I like to tweet about um, alcohol and drug issues. I teach alcohol and drug studies, so sometimes I tweet about that. We will include links to those places on the show notes page for this episode. Matthew, thank you so much for talking about delirium tremens, the temperance movement, the rise of the medical profession. Boy, we really covered a lot today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Liz. I really enjoyed myself. Today, we think of doctors as learned professionals. But as Matthew just revealed, our early American forebears thought quite differently. Well, at least prior to the 1840s. Physicians worked with delirium tremens patients during the 1780s, 90s, and early 1800s, placed doctors in a position where they could seize onto a reform movement like temperance and use it to legitimate the professionalism of their work. And they did this by working to reform. They continued to treat patients with alcoholic insanity. They worked to curb excessive drinking. And they also advocated against the use of unorthodox medical procedures, which they thought would benefit society. I'd like to say a word about Dumbo. As a small child, I loved the movie because it's about an elephant who, against all odds, learned how to fly and achieve his dreams. I have always had a fondness for animals, but especially for dogs and elephants. So this is exactly why Dumbo was my favorite movie. In Rum Maniacs, in the epilogue, I read about how pink elephants is really about patients who suffer from the awful and real disease of delirium tremens. So I was a bit horrified that I'd really liked the movie. I was also horrified a few weeks ago 
when I recently rewatched the movie with my young niece. I just had no idea how racist the movie was either. One of the best songs in the movie is When I See an Elephant Fly. The catchy tune is sung by black crows. The lead crow, his name is Jim. The crows, their speech, and song depict African-American minstrel shows. And Jim Crow is the name given to the repressive system of segregation used after Reconstruction. So, yeah, Dumbo, not my favorite movie now, but I do have fond memories of loving it as a child before I knew all the history that I know now. And I also can tell you now that my niece is too young to understand the messages in Dumbo. But I do look forward to having a serious conversation with her about its underlying messages when she gets a bit older. You can find more information about Matthew, his work, Rum Maniacs, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash zero four three. Would you be my Sybil Luddington? In April 1777, Sybil Luddington rode 40 miles throughout eastern New York during the night, mind you to raise the militia to help fight the British Redcoats during their raid of Danbury, Connecticut. By the morning, Sybil had raised nearly a regiment of troops which fought under her father, Colonel Henry Ludington. Now, Sybil's ride may not be as famous, but she definitely rode twice the distance of Paul Revere. So there you go. I am looking for you to perform a Sybil Ludington-inspired act. Would you please tell your friends, family, and fellow history lovers about our show? Word of mouth recommendations are the best way for new listeners to find us. And if you find people who show interest in Ben Franklin's world, please tell them that they can either visit the website benfranklinsworld.com for more information or ask them to text BFWORLD to 33444 so they can receive the show notes for each episode right in their inbox and gain access to Poor Richard's Club, our private social community of Ben Franklin's World listeners on Facebook. I'd like to thank Matthew Bodish for bringing Sybil Ludington and her deeds to my attention. If you know of another inspiring early American man or woman whom I can use to ask you for help to spread the word about Ben Franklin's World in a fun and informative way, please send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, post a comment to the show notes page of this episode or in Poor Richard's Club, or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.